Don't give up when someone denies you your right. Thank you very much. This is this month's legislative update. Continue pushing it a step forward. We two bodies are all not alike. Yeah. Right? If you give people the chance and the encouragement and some supports, amazing things can happen. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. My very special co-host today is Amani Cruzan. Amani is a recent graduate of the University of Minnesota Hubbard School of Journalism. I'm very proud of her for that. And Amani, you have some special guests today, and you're going to tell us what you're going to talk about. Yes. Yeah, so I have a self-advocate named Katie Cummins Baco and David Fenley with the uh, Minnesota Council on Disability. He's their ADA director, and I'm going to be talking about winter accessibility and inclusion and hopefully get some resources out there for people. Well, that sounds great. Uh, my guest today will be Cody Olson from the Minnesota Council on Disability. We recently had a, a gathering with uh, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan in the Senate to talk about the issues coming up in this upcoming 2020 uh, legislative session, which isn't too far away. and. Uh, so we'll discuss those things in, in a couple minutes here on Disability Viewpoints. We hope you'll stay tuned. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes. With me today as my special guest is Cody Olson from the Minnesota Council on Disability. And then Chris Sears from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Thank you. Uh, uh, Phenomenal writer. We hope you see some of his articles in the. You know, he had a recent one in the last Sunday's paper that was very good. So, uh, Cody, uh, a cup about a month from now, we're going to start out the 2020 legislative session, and that'll be uh, Tuesdays at the Capitol. It'll mean a whole bunch of things. Yes, uh, recently we had uh, a session with Governor Walls and the Lieutenant Governor on what some of the things we think we're going to talk about this legislative session. How about we review some of those at this point? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, thank you for having me on the show. Sure. And I think, you know, just to start, um, you know, a recent um, article that came out on Star Tribune um, right above the headline was disability rights are going to be the center of the legislative session. And, um, you know, being in, in disability policy and the people who are our, our community we hope that that rings true. Um, we mm -hmm. hope that's more than just a, a headline. Uh, we actually want to see action done. Right. And so um, I think the governor and our bipartisan panel of legislators was an excellent, um, an excellent first step in, mm -hmm. in actually realizing that, um, that goal. And so the governor, we had both the governor and lieutenant governor attend our panel. And anyone who's been following Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, um, we know their slogan is One Minnesota. Right. And that's an issue that they talk about in our, po in our panel um, when they provided the welcoming remarks is One Minnesota especially means people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And so the governor talked about his vision for barrier-free Minnesota and also realizing that not only do we have to have a goal, but we also have to, we have to back our priorities with resources and we have to back our priorities with actual legislation. Right, absolutely. Um, the uh, community, uh, community Tuesdays at the Capitol, mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about those so people can absolutely. start planning to come on down to see us down there? Absolutely, so the Brain Injury Alliance hosts a fantastic, in, in partnership with many other wonderful uh, stakeholders, the Tuesdays at the Capitol event, which is every Tuesday, I believe it's nine to 10 o'clock, they meet in the Department of Transportation cafeteria mm -hmm. to uh, talk about what happened last week and what's happening next week in, in the political issues that we wanna see solved it, at the Capitol. And so this is a great opportunity for uh, members of the disability community to connect um, with the issues at the Capitol and to um, have a forum to discuss what you wanna see addressed and also to have a structure to actually go out and meet your legislators on a weekly basis. We had a, a interesting, like we said, when we got together with uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan and Governor Walls uh, recently, we had two different groups. 
One group we got into the Senate and got to. Uh, the second group had their issues that we just plain ran out of time, I guess, because yeah, all the folks in the audience got a chance to state their case and what their issues were going to be for this legislative session. The second group that we didn't get to, can you tell me what some of their issues might have been? Mm -hmm. So before I go into that, I want to just first you know, talk about that first half because we had a really incredible turnout from the disability community with our legislative forum on disability. We had a really cool bipartisan group of panelists uh, of legislators who represented bonding committees, health and human services, and transportation. And these are all issues that MCD is working very hard on and that members of the disability community really want to see some action on. And so it was just really incredible to see a huge line of people mm -hmm. wanting to speak to their legislators. Um, we only intended to have about 20 to 30 minutes of remarks from the audience and it ended up taking over an hour and a half. So yeah. it was just an incredible display of commitment and advocacy from the disability community. And, right. and I was just so honored to be part of that. Right, and people did get a chance to testify. Would you like to talk about that at this point? We let everybody get through the line. Absolutely, everybody got to speak. So that was the really cool thing about that event. Okay. So what we didn't hear in the second half was a community panel that we had invited uh, from folks like the ARC Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance, Minnesota Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities, and the, the MACEL, the Centers for Independent Living, right. as well as NAMI. So we asked them to uh, come and speak to some of their legislative priorities. And uh, while we didn't get to hear that, some of them were able to, uh, you'll get to see their agendas being published in the, in the coming days. Right. For example, the ARC Minnesota, um, Minnesota, MCD has been a part of a larger stakeholder group that the ARC Minnesota has put together. And this stakeholder group has really focused in on how can we prevent sexual violence in the disability community, and that's it huge right. issue that we really need to see more attention put on. Um, and so there's a, gr a group put together and we're exploring policy solutions on what we can do to, to reduce the abysmal rate of sexual violence right. in the disability community. That's a, that's a big issue these days. It's and a huge that, issue. It kind of bothers me that it is, but it's the real world out there and it is a big issue. Um, I myself got up for a couple minutes and spoke on Metro Mobility and uh, I said it's nice to have money to put forth for Metro Mobility, but it is known as the issue. The issue at this time is, is, is management. And what I forgot to say or didn't say, and I'm going to say it now, what the plan was, uh, and that is to uh, introduce a bill to get it back to the Metropolitan Transit Com uh, Commission, like it was in 1976, and forego the contractors and get it under one roof so that the city bus drivers who have a strong union, yes they do, but they had they won't lose their seniority, they'll keep their benefits and what makes a difference, they'll stay at the same rate of pay and they'll they'll whether they drive a forty foot bus or a city bus or a metro mobility van, it shouldn't make a difference. I think the initial cost, because it got changed over, will be ridiculously high. But I think at the end of the day, we'll be able to streamline operations and might have a, a better run system and then take the city map and bust it into six zones so you have buses coming in and out and make this service uh, more efficient. However, at this point, I'm going to also say that I have talked to Sandy Maslin and called for an audit with Jim Nobles. And so that'll be up and coming. And, uh, and that's what I have to say about that. But I, I just... We can't let this go on. You know, you get home at 10 to 2 in the morning or, mm -hmm. you know, you have a ride that changed that didn't tell you, then you got phone lines all over the place, nobody gets hold of you because nobody tried. And so that tells me that management is lax, and that's all I'll say about it. So let's cover some of the other issues at this point. Cody, go ahead. So um, another issue, um, so the Minnesota Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities um, released some of their Tier 1 issues, which means that they're going to be fighting the hardest for. And one of those issues uh, is a similar issue that the council on, uh, is a partnership with the Council on Disability, actually, and that is reforming the way that our PCA transportation is. Um, so one thing that we at the council want to do, we've been working in partnership with a lot of advocates and with different advocacy organizations. We want to see an expansion of the different types of reimbursable activities under a PCA's plan. And we want that to include transportation. So we want, um, you know, we want to be able to see uh, folks who use PCA services 
being able to utilize their services for the purpose of transportation because Mark, like you said, transportation is so important to getting around in your community. Well, it is the PCA issues first and we have trouble with that because there we can't pay enough. What has to happen with the PCA issue is it has to be on a tiered system per education. Then you move up to the to the wage scale. And I think Chris has done some stories on those very things. Mm -hmm. And then the transportation next. If you're gonna have the transportation, you have the PCA so you can go to your work or your school or whichever it is. So mm -hmm. do you have a final thought, Cody? I think the last thing that I wanna say is, you know, there was a great comment from a legislator who said we need to stop balancing the, the budget on the backs of people with disabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, talking about that $15 an hour for PCA professionals, um, we need to, like Governor Wall said, we need to back our priorities with our resources and right. legislation. Okay. Chris Sears, do you have any comments you want to make? Oh, I, I just think this session is making, uh, is, is making up to be incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things you cited was policy and what really stands out uh, to me, at least so far this year, is that um, th there seems to be more of a focus on policy as well as on uh, issues that affect people's real daily lives. Absolutely. Quality of life issues seem at the forefront. Uh, transportation, metro mobility, you brought up sexual violence, the fact that uh, you know, violence against uh, women with disabilities is you know, at least three times greater than, uh, than others. And uh, you know, there are all kinds of quality of life issues that, to be quite frank, in other years, in budget years, tends to get lost. Do you want to talk about anything coming up on the Star Tribune before we go? Well, I think we're going to be covering the, you know, the session, uh, you know, some of these exciting proposals. Um, one of the things that uh, I thought was exciting was that uh, ARC Minnesota, um, on their legislative agenda, they would really like to address uh, guardianship reform. Mm -hmm. You know, there's about 15,000 uh, people in this state, adults with disabilities, that have guardians that control uh, broad areas of their lives, you know, their everyday decision making. And there is a place for guardians, but um, a number of other states, at least a dozen, dozen other states, have actually explored alternatives to guardianship that would give people more power over their lives. And um, I just think that's one of the examples of these quality of life issues, right. uh, personal liberty issues that I think uh, will be promising this session. Sounds great. Well, at this time, I'd like to thank Cody Olson from the Minnesota State Council on Disability, uh, Chris Sears from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. As thank always, you. thanks for thank coming you. on over here. Uh, and I want to thank Joan Wilshire also before we go on, on giving me the opportunity on Metro Mobility. Even though I've ridden it way too often, maybe, uh, I've learned a lot of things, and I guess we'll keep learning as things develop. And as things develop, we'll let you know right here on Disability Viewpoints. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Imani Cruzen, and today I am speaking with self-advocate Katie Cummins-Bacco and David Fenley with the Minnesota Council on Disability. Uh, as we approach uh, several more months of winter, I know that snow and ice can make accessibility a little more difficult, so I am happy to be able to speak with them a little bit about accessibility and inclusion in winter. So thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I guess to get started, for people who aren't very thinking very often about accessibility in winter time, could you tell me a little bit about maybe what are some of the accessibility issues that people with disabilities are thinking about going into winter? Well, I use um, two crutches to walk. So um, for me personally, some of the Specific issues, of course, are the snow and the ice. And um, I still like to take walks in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and you can definitely tell the maintenance of the sidewalks and where people are a little better at it than others. A really tough issue is when the sidewalk gets to the road. Um, people often will shovel up to that junction and mm -hmm. not past it. So it makes it really hard to get to the street from the sidewalk. So that's a pretty big issue for me. Mm -hmm. um, and generally just keeping the sidewalks clear, which is, um, as a St. Paul resident, it's our responsibility at my house and of all the neighbors too. So that's something that can be pretty tricky in the winter time. I have to make sure to wear really good boots, just like anyone else. But if you think about how I have my two feet plus my two crutches, and both of them have to be stable. It makes it a lot harder if that's not maintained well for me. Mm -hmm. 
That's, I, so at the Council on Disability, I field calls uh, similar to this on a regular basis. Um, my, my disabilities don't limit my mobility, so I don't have that personal experience. But I do have some understanding of what the laws and regulations are around snow clearing. And strangely enough, there is no statewide law that requires uh, people to clear their sidewalks. It's governed at the city level or the municipal, municipal level. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of them do have rules. You know, you have to clear if you're a homeowner, you have to clear it within 24 hours after a snowfall. Um, if you're a business owner, a lot of the times it's four hours. Um, um, but snow clearing is a major issue. There is a state law, though, that you can't put snow in disability parking spots. You'd think that would go without saying. But, you know, snow plow operators sometimes think, oh, here's an open place to put snow. Yeah, no, people use that to park and have access and, you know, live independently. So don't put uh, the snow in the access aisle. It's not a free space. It's a space that's used by folks with disabilities to actually leave their house. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, a lot of times the, the whose responsibility it is to clear snow, whether it's a transportation organization, whether it's a county, whether it's a city, whether it's a business, whether it's a homeowner, um, whether it's the state, um, is, is not clear. Um, and I can assist with finding out whose responsibility is to, cl to clear that, play, that, that space. But uh, it's, best to usually, it's best usually to go to the city if you have complaints about homeowners. Um, or if you have complaints about snow clearing in front of businesses or, or city mm -hmm. streets, they can do a good job of directing you to the proper place to find out who needs to clear. Because there is a, an obligation, both city ordinances and the ADA, to keep walkways clear. Okay. And as the ADA director with the Minnesota Council on Disability, I guess, is there anything people should know um, besides what you just discussed um, when it comes to how the ADA applies to winter accessibility? So yeah, the, the, the ADA does state pretty clearly that business owners, so Title III of the ADA applies to public accommodations. That would be like the private sector, whether it's a stadium, whether it's a business, whether it's a bar, whether it's a, it's, you know, and anywhere where you can go as a member of the public, it does state that, that they need to maintain clear and accessible routes. Um, they, you know, that's the parking. That's uh, the front entrance, that's the accessible route up to the front entrance. The ADA does require that they keep that clear on a regular basis. It's not just, you know, once a week if it snows, you know, get out there regularly and clear the snow. Um, um, so so if, if someone who does have uh, a disability has a complaint, they can go to the Department of Human Rights. They can also call the Department of Justice if they so desire, um, and if they need assistance in, in, in Finding out who to call, they can call our agency, and we're more than happy to assist them in determining where they need to go to get snow cleared. If it's in their apartment building, if it's in front of their um, um, local business, yeah, all that, all that stuff. There is an obligation to clear that snow. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. It's really good to know. I didn't yeah. know as when you said I'm a self-advocate, I think that's such an interesting point that more of us need to learn about, that there is so much more out there for us to help represent us and, and advocate for us. I, the target near my house does not have enough parking spots and it becomes so much more obvious in the winter time because it's cold for everybody. It doesn't feel good to <laughs> run from your car when it's 10 degrees and snowing out, but taking accessible parking places is not the answer and that's what I see so much more often in the winter time and mm -hmm. and I'll even see somebody waiting in the car as if they're saying well when somebody who needs the spot comes then I'll move but they assume that we're going to get out and say I need that parking spot which I'm not going to do because getting in and out of a car is very difficult for me and I'm only going to do it the amount of times I plan to. And if I can't park there, I go home. I don't do my grocery shopping. Um, and so in the past, I've done things like leave notes on cars. I've gone to the business and talked to them. And they don't know who they're supposed to talk to. Um, and so then I don't know who to talk to. So just I've learned so much already today just by speaking with both of you. It, you know, that, that highlights a a point that I encounter quite frequently. And I, I, I really view this as 
Like it's a cultural problem. Um, and winter, of course, magnifies that. But someone who says, oh, I'm just going to be here for a few minutes to run in, well, you know, you're essentially stomping on the rights of an individual with a disability to, in many instances, leave their house. You know, people view disability parking as a privilege, like, oh, you're so lucky you get to park so close to the door. No, it's, I'm so lucky I get to leave my home. Exactly. That's what it is. It's about independence. It's not a privilege. It's, it, it, it literally allows you to be, to interact in the world the same way everybody else does. Mm -hmm. and, and folks need to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I guess going from that, when it comes to um, individuals, what should they know when it comes to accessibility in winter and um, even from a city perspective or um, ADA perspective, what are their responsibilities too? What I try to explain to people when I've had a situation that has been less than ideal for me as a woman with disabilities is just getting out the door was effort for me. I live in chronic pain. Um, I think my upcoming surgery will be my 28th. Um, just getting up, getting dressed and out the door was already a lot of effort for me. So when I interact with somebody in the public, it's not my first struggle of the day. And so if they just think, well, what's the big deal? You just didn't get to park closer to the building. It's actually, I've burned through so much of my energy already and I may be reaching my pain limit already in the day by the time I get there, that it's the difference between getting my groceries or not. And emotionally, it feels like they're basically saying to me, you don't matter enough to me as a community member for me to acknowledge the fact that you have the legitimate right to park here, and I don't, but I don't care. I'm going to take it anyway. Um, I think people just need to step back and imagine what life would be like for them if the most basic human right, which is to leave their home and be part of society, was removed from them, because it's so isolating already. So when you make this effort to leave your home and it's stymied, <laughs> you know, by the first stop you make in your day, it's very, it makes you really sad and feel really isolated. And um, like you're a second class citizen in the community. Um, yeah, and I want, and I mean, I want understanding and empathy, mm -hmm. not pity and, oh, your life is so hard. It, it's really, all. it's it's a distinct difference. It and is. society tends to focus on the, oh, I feel so sorry for you. It's like, I don't want your pity. Mm -mm. Just don't park in my, in my spot. I'm, uh, yeah, there are just certain things that were given to even the playing field. I, I love the fact that I have crutches because they're my ticket out of my door. I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I live my life to the fullest that I know how, um, but I just want the respect and the, the resources that were provided to me as somebody with limitations so I can live to the fullest. And I guess when it comes to people who maybe want to be more of an ally when it comes to accessibility and inclusion in the winter time. What should people be thinking about when it comes to inviting people with disabilities out to activities, um, when it comes to how they can make sure the venue is accessible or the activity is accessible? What can people be working on? Go ahead. I'm, so um, I work with businesses pretty regularly and a lot of the times what I hear from them is, oh, those people never come here anyways. And they view it as, you know, oh, there's nobody like that in my community. You know, people with disabilities represent 25% of the U.S. population. That's a large number of folks. That's a large number of folks. Many disabilities are not apparent. You can't see them. Um, and usually the case is, is those people aren't coming into your business and they're not frequenting your, your um, establishment because you're not accessible and they're taking their business elsewhere. Um, I, to answer your question, the first thing that I, that I would say when calling up a business is to say, are you accessible? Mm -hmm. And if they say no, say, well, then I'm going to go somewhere else and spend my money. So they know they're losing business because that is, unfortunately, that's, you know, the, 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 one of the um, easiest ways to convince a business person that accessibility is important. Um, do you have anything to add to that? 
Just some general things to like if you don't, if it's first come, first serve, if you call and say, I have a mobility issue or a disability of some kind, you need to take reservations from that person because we can't wait an hour to go sit down at a table um, the way somebody who is able bodied can do that. Or, um, well, the bars in the bathroom for sure. There are places all along university that don't even have bars in the bathroom, let alone. Um, an accessible stall. Um, there was something else that I was thinking about. Um, invite your friends out. Yeah. Don't not invite them because you think that they oh, might not be able to participate. That's just treating somebody with a disability differently than you would treat um, somebody else in society and that's mm -hmm. exactly what we don't want. We want you to just treat us like everybody else. Don't think it's awkward because you know, we look different or we move different or we right. think different. Right. Uh, a lot of, like First Avenue, um, I don't know if the myth is still open, but they have seating for people with disabilities. So if you have a friend who has a disability, don't even ask them. Just get seats where they can, or get tickets and then call and say, somebody I'm coming with has a disability. And then call your friend and say, I got us tickets. It's all taken care of. Just try to make it not such a big deal on the person with the disability all the time because we always feel like such a burden. So if you can take away some of those um, limitations that we have in going out with, without it being a big issue, it just normalizes so much more for us. Okay, well, thank you both for sharing your perspectives and I think a resource for people if they want to learn more is, of course, the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, and they can always reach out to you or anyone with the council just to learn more. And I want to thank both of you for coming on and um, thank you for watching. I hope viewers were able to learn a little bit more about inclusion in the winter time. And thanks again to Katie and David. Thank you. Thank Well, already we've gone and had another edition of Disability Viewpoints. I'd like to this time thank my guest, Cody Olson, from the Minnesota Council on Disability, who will be joining us for the legislative update during the legislative session this year, and Christopher Sears from the Minneapolis Star Tribune, who does an outstanding job always on here. And uh, we talked about some great issues today and hope you'll join us for Community Tuesdays at the Capitals from 10 to 11 on Tuesdays at the Minnesota Department of Transportation Cafeteria. And uh, Armani, it was an honor having you as our co-host today, too. Thank you, Mark. And I want to thank Katie and David for coming on and talking about winter accessibility and inclusion. And I'm hoping it's helpful for people who are watching so they can learn a little bit more about how to be inclusive. Great. Well, thank you for being here. Hope you come back and see us. And uh, we'll see you back here soon. Again, for the entire team here at Disability Viewpoints, I'm Mark Hughes. With Amani Cruz, and thanks for watching this video viewpoints. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.